This is the BBC third programme. How to Listen, including How Not To, How You Ought To, and How You Won't, by Stephen Potter and Joyce Grenfell. How. 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 The programme is about to begin. We are rehearsing the opening announcement. The last details are being added. In the studio, last directions from the producer. The producer is speaking. And rather quicker on cues than those quotation lines, everybody. Last details. We can expect to pick up ten seconds. Oh, yes, thanks. Charles, Charles, you missed that light on page 12. There was a muddle. Yes, I know I did. I'm very sorry, but I didn't know that line was cut. Yeah, the whole line's out. Yes, I know. Entirely my fault. No, my fault. Oh, no, my fault. Yes, my fault. One minute to go. You'll go ahead on green light then, Pat. Right. One minute to go. We can hear now the music of the programme before. The producer hands over to the actors and to the engineers. Less than a minute to go now. All the work in the writing and the rehearsing of the programme, all now coming to a head, all boiling down to this one supreme moment. Half a minute to go. And the producer, suspended in space, as it were, seems to see the whole as it ought to be. For a second, his vision extends even beyond to the audience, to a million wireless sets at the other end, a million separate audiences. Are they ready? Are they listening? Here, the house is empty. There, the set is switched off. But here, license number 865432, Mrs. Moss. Is she listening? Turn up the wireless, Mrs. Moss. Yes, dear, it is chilly tonight. Let's turn the wireless up a bit. That's right, that's right. That's better. Pussy's first, still coming out. I'll put the kettle on and we'll have a nice cup. Yes, but, but is she really going to listen? On, on to another radio set. Where are we now? Let's look in at the window of Baltimore Gardens. It's your call. I said four clubs. Four clubs. Uh, can I have the bidding again, please? Well, pass one club, pass two clubs, pass three clubs, pass four clubs. Oh, sorry. I say, could we have the radio down a little, please? Yes, let's have it down a little. It's a bit difficult to concentrate on, Bridge. But my programme, they're not listening. Yes, yes, I know. We'll try another set, rather more promising. Aubrey Street, Mayfair. I, I'd rather like you to listen to this. I'd love to. <laughs> it's my new toy. I, I'll switch on. Where is it? Well, the radio set is in the cocktail cabinet, which isn't a cocktail cabinet at all, really. How marvellous. <laughs> yes, I hope it works, because it was fairly expensive. It's a thing called a supersonic incessor switch. Uh, do you know anything about these things? Yes. No, 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 but I'm frightfully interested. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, you see, you press your foot, mm. like that, you see. Uh, press your foot, and the wavelength changes by itself. Uh, wait a minute. I think that's it. How marvellous. But my programme, doesn't he realise? Can't we... Wait, wait, we'll try again. Pine Avenue. Switch on and listen, V. I can't, I'm all greasy. Well, what's the good of having a wireless if you don't use it? Oh, all right. Thought so. That's the music program. Uh, not quite half past nine. I thought you were going to take the dog out. <laughs> Look at him. He heard you say that. Well, as soon as I fix the utility arming board, uh, what's it say? A fix nail 18 inches below point C. Oh, well, being a practical man, I always carry a foot rule. Oh, funny, I haven't got it. Charlie. <laughs> I'll tell you something about these little sets. This little bit of wire is exactly one foot six from plug to screw in to outer. Charlie, you are observant. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, for sake. 
Got it. Surely you've stopped the music. Well, what's the good of having a wireless set if you don't use it? Oh, dear. Surely somebody. Let's try Mrs. Moss again. What's that funny noise in your wireless? Oh, that's always going on. I don't know what it is. It's a funny noise. Doesn't it worry you? No, I don't hate to notice. Oh, God, can't we find a better set? A good hotel set, for instance. That ought to be all right. In the hotel lounge, listening in public. Oh, well, <laughs> there's nothing like silence. Yeah, yeah, yes, I agree with you. There's nothing like the silence of a hotel lounge after lunch. Uh, no, no coffee, thank you. Isn't it ghastly? How about turning on the wireless? Now we've got a spot of quiet, let's listen to some music. Good idea. That's Rack Maninoff. No, it is not. It's not Grieg, is it? Grieg, dear lady. I love that thing. Oh, yes, it was in that film about the girl being psychoanalyzed. It was frightfully good. I believe the girl actually did the playing. I mean, it was her actually playing in the film. I'm not sure, but I thought Eileen Joyce did the playing and Anne Todd acted it. I don't think that's the Grieg. Or the Red Man and all. It's not as if I do like Eileen Joyce. She plays like a man. Lovely man. Stop, stop, stop. Listen. They're not listening. My program is about to begin. My program. I... But who's this? One more listener. Can it be that he is listening? The producer sees, or imagines he sees, the real listener, the ideal listener. And careful, quiet. That's right. Program's at half past nine. Just check again with the Radio Times, will you, my dear? It's the one we marked, isn't it? Now, check with the clock in the hall. 9.29. Just time to tune in properly. Just time to tune in. Dead centre. That's right. You made the fire up, dear, haven't you? That's right. Let's see. Are we likely to want the high frequencies or the low frequencies on this programme? Not too high like that. Not too low like that. So now, we just get quite comfortable. You're just a shade in my line of hearing, and you're sitting a little too near, surely, my dear. You told anyone not to be disturbed for 40 minutes, haven't you? Now, if you'll just turn out that top light while I turn the speaker up a shade, only a fraction. That's right. I can't bear it. He's found him. I can't believe it. Here he is at last. The perfect listener. The perfect listener. Somebody really listening. What shall we give him? The whole of Shakespeare. The whole of Beethoven. Yes, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's one department of broadcasting that you haven't touched on at all. And you must bring in here and now, and that's me myself. Who are you? I'm listener research. And I should like to say that if you're trying to suggest that there's such a thing as perfect broadcasting, you are wrong. Equally, there's no such thing as a perfect listener. Maybe there's such a thing as a best possible listener... But they'll be different for each ty type of program and different for each hour of the day. Sometimes we ask individual listeners why they listen. They listen, you see, for different reasons. I always hear dance music whenever I switch on the wireless. There's literally nothing on the air except classical music and talk. When do people dine? All the programs I ever want to listen to seem to be when I'm dining. Yes, yes, but you've heard how they listen. My job is to ask them why. Now, if we could now for a few minutes switch from one listener to another and ask them why they listen. Now, Mrs. Moss, I've come to ask you a question from listener research. Oh, I never believe in those things. It's for Mrs. Moss. Oh, no one's ever asked me. I mean, no one's ever asked me. Well, I'm asking you now. Now, why do you listen? Oh, I couldn't do without me, wireless. No, that would never do. Well, I keep it on for the company as much as anything. Well, I don't listen to it all the time, but it's nice to hear it going on. You get used to it. I like to have a sit down and listen to the services. Sing him if I know it. I like the bands. I like Sandy. I like the children's hour. Oh, I like anything, really. I'm not fussy. But I don't like too much talking. I can't get on with what I'm doing if there's too much talking. 
Can't make out what they're talking about half the time. Just do it to hear ourselves speak, I think. I see. Thank you. So, um, why do you listen, Mrs. Trouble? Mrs. Trouble. Hmm? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Mrs. Trouble. Uh, well, uh, we English people are fond of a jolly good laugh, and uh, every day they have something for laughing, and comes to cheer every day us up. Once in a while, I'm finding uh, no need for frownings all the time. We English are full of fun and sports. Uh -huh, thank you, Mrs. Troibel. E, e, Troibel. Mm, oh, oh, exactly. <clears throat> and now, uh, now let's ask Sydney at school. Well, how old are you, Sydney? <laughs> You're five, aren't you? I got a little girl the same age as you. <laughs> a little shy. Going on six, actually. <laughs> uh, ever turn on the wireless, Sydney? Come along, Sydney. Do you ever turn on the wireless? No, dear, don't do that. Pay attention, dear. The gentleman's asking you if you ever listen to the wireless. You do, don't you, Sydney? You like Toy Town, don't you, Sydney? You <laughs> see, he's smiling. I think that evokes quite a memory. And the music we have in the morning? You like that, don't you? He's not very musical, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sydney. <clears throat> and now, why do you listen, Len? Can I... Well, step right inside. Thank you so much. Well, this is the sitting room, but I've more or less taken it over for me, gramophone and radio. Oh, yes. You see, I happen to be Honsek of the South East 41 Rhythm Club, and we have our committee meetings in this room, decide our policy and our attitude to things and so on. I've wired all this stuff up myself, learned all about it when I was working in the bike shop. Aye, Jove, has a big set, Len. Well, most of that front is baffle board, of course, with plenty of baffle, you don't get so much chatter. Uh, but... Oh, yes, yes. It's but... a push-button control, and it's all two-way, you see, for tone. For instance, this is home. Mm -hmm. Or I can get more top on it by pushing the switch down. You see, there wasn't nearly as much woof on that, was there? Yes. Uh, no, no. There's not no. much to listen to at the moment. AFN Munich doesn't come on till later. There's only the BBC on now. This is the light. This is the light without the woof. And, of course, this is Program C. You know about that? Yes. Well, it's all on a hypertonic two-way megacycle. Yeah. Outside the megatonic. Oh, you mean that... I mean, you'll get some very funny results. And now, I've always wanted to ask you, do you listen, Miss Fern Brixton? Uh, Miss Fern Brixton? Hmm? Ooh, ooh, yes, rather. And why do you listen, Professor Crump? Well, I have to listen professionally. Oh, really? How enormously interesting. Well, I'm by way of being a sociologist, of course, and radio is part of the manners and customs of the human race, I suppose, as much as any other manifestation of the complexities of the human spirit. Yes, yes, I do see. I wonder if you happen to like my special pigeon, folk music. Uh, folk music is what I'm after. There is, of course, very little of it today. Oh, I think I contradict you. No, no, excuse me. I mean, very little in the sense that the grand old basic tunes, at any rate of the Western people, are quickly becoming vestigial. Yes, I see. Well, I've come to the conclusion that modern so-called swing jazz is the folk music of today. That shocks you, doesn't it? You see, I hold a view that Ginger Rogers is the voice of the people, the song voice. And in years to come, long after we've gone... That's going to be the folk music of this present era. Or, as I put it, become the folk music of the past, which is, of course, now to us the present. Yes, yes, of course. You know this one, don't you? Heaven, boom, boom. I'm in heaven, boom, boom. And my heart beats so that I can hardly speak, boom, 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 boom. And, and then, of course, there's... I say tomatoes, you say tomatoes. I say potatoes, you say potatoes. It's a different pronunciation, of course. Oh, he's gone. Oh... And finally, oh yes, finally, why do you listen, Mr. Pantel? Did you ask? Mm. I say, why do you listen? Me? Well, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I'm not an awfully good listener. Oh, but you... In fact, I'm afraid I never do. Well, that's impossible. Why? I'm afraid I don't like radio very much. I don't like it. There must be something. Perhaps you don't like music. I love it, but not radio music. Oh, you don't care tuppence for it, isn't that it? Not enough to buy the Radio Times and find out when the music you want is being played. Oh, I know all about that. But I think I simply don't like things coming through funnels. Oh, you're joking. I have listened, you know. In the old days, I used to try listening a lot. Oh, yeah? Well, it always seemed to me that 
first thing in the morning, it sounded like this. There are those who resolutely refuse to hear the whispering message of the lower bow, whose motto would seem to be, what I have, I hold. Constipation may even be due to taking medicines to cure it, to taking laxatives as a routine. Please don't whip your bowel each day into a chronic frenzy of irritable activity. Before breakfast. And then immediately after breakfast, or even while breakfast was still going on, it sounded like this. I love you. I love you. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. And when I listen to a drama or a play, it sounded like this. Look here, Amberton. You can't do this to me. Oh, my dear. If only I had understood. But it's madness. There was only one man who came back from Kraj Patal alive. And he wasn't a very pretty sight. You see, I really wanted something jollier. I, I was told to listen to Pelodrome Picnic. It sounded like this. And now welcome once more to that quiz wizard, our jovial host, Mac McCutcheon! <laughs> hello there, folks. Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you. This is Mac McCutcheon wishing you lots of fun. Now, who's first tonight, eh? A charming young lady in a most becoming hat, if I may say so. Oh, <laughs> my, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> And what is your name, young lady? Hmm? Jean Gledding. Jean Gledding. I dream of Jeannie with a nut brown hair. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> and where do you come from, Jean Gledding? Bexley Heath. Folks, this is my friend and your friend, Jean Gledding of Bexley Heath. <laughs> and what did you do in the war, Jean? I was in the ATS. Well done, Jean Gilly. And what are you doing now? Well, I'm still in the ATS. <laughs> stick to it, Jean. Stick to it, Jean Gilly of Bexley Heath. Now, we want you to help us with our queer quiz here tonight. We want you to close your eyes. Yes, that's right. And choose a folded paper from the magic box. Hello, hello. The little lady's in a bit of a hurry, eh? <laughs> now, the number is 69, is it, Jean Gledding? 69, I don't know. Like the 96. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were right, Jean. First time, Jean Gledding of Bexley Heath has drawn number 69. Now then, who has number 69? 69, you, sir? Ah, a gallant member of His Majesty's forces. <laughs> See what I mean. And then, when I listened to that clever little satirical feature somebody told me about, it didn't seem frightfully clever. We present how <laughs> to confuse. In fact, I couldn't quite follow it. Then somebody suggested that I ought to listen to something really better, something really good. One of those poetical dramas with music by B B one of the bees. What was it? It went like this. Ho, mighty Pliathon, whose realms all Thracy and the Tyres glean. Fetch forth the imagined coralope, fleet windward of the Semathenes, and tell all wisdom of thy bitterness. Aga, Aga, Aga. Stay thy thrall, comes one hot foot with tidings. One, one. 
warn the citizens, warn, warn the aged and the green-limbed youth. Far die moth and old secretary are nearing. Call from the naked tower, from battlement and cottage mild. Warn, warn all false fruits of their vaporings and set the curse among them. Whoa. 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 You do see. Then some have suggested I ought to listen to one of those spontaneous discussions. Spontaneous discussions, you know. Not too provocative, but of course not afraid either to say what they mean. And now we must let our typical housewife, typical businesswoman, and uh, typical chairman resume. <coughs> no, that's not what our object is. Our object to people not being allowed to do things their way. Oh, come now, Mrs. Hetting, you can't be quite as definite as that, or where would we all be? One must have some rules, you know. Uh, I, uh, I, I think I agree with Mrs. Um, Hetting, Dr. Judge. So long as we deliver the goods, as it were, I don't see that it matters. Uh, what method has been used? Uh, you, you wouldn't presume to tell me how to run my house, would you, Dr. Judge? Uh, no, no, a thousand times, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, then, um, nor would I attempt to tell you how to run your office. Uh, not that I couldn't if I tried, but still. <laughs> <laughs> you do, see? Then somebody told me that if I really wanted to appreciate the marvels of radio, in the mechanical sense, I mean... For the romance of the actual, these are the marvels of the immediate, I only had to switch on at various odd times in the day. This is King Worthy Sanderson speaking to you from the Britannia. I'm speaking to you now from the chart room of Commodore Sir Brendan Spears on that great ship, the Britannia. Well, we had a very good day. Uh, reporting to give you news of the great uh, of our great ship, the Britannia, I, I can say that we travel 692 miles in the last 24 hours, which makes us uh, 692 miles further away from the Bishop Rock on our long journey. Uh, now, the, the, the first thing I'm, I'm going to ask uh, C Commodore Sir Brendan Spears is what is our destination? Well, he tells me, with a wink of his eye, he's not sailing under sealed orders, and he can tell us right away. Uh, it is New York. But what about that little gust of wind we blew into just now? I'm asking Commodore uh, Sir Brendan Spears this question. He, he tells me that it wasn't a gust of wind at all. It was a moderate breeze. Uh, and uh, what prospects, I asked him. Well, with a, with a wink of the eye, he said... So, here, here is King, King Werther Sanderson saying goodbye to you from the deck of the great ship, the Britannia. So, King Werther Sanderson hands you over to the studio, but back to London now. This is the BBC Home Service. That was King Werther Sanderson broadcasting to you from the deck of the Britannia. Of course, it's wonderful to think that he's really there. Seems impossible, in a way. But, of course, I suppose the point is I'm keen on literature and poetry. In fact, somebody told me to turn on the literary programs. I was told these are written specially for people like me. So I had a try. One hundred years ago this month, the memorial tablet to Thomas Copley, the Dartmoor poet, was erected at Walby Chapel in Ipswich. From the East Coast Regional Wavelength, therefore, we present this evening Thomas Cobley, Poet, a Portrait. Back now, back to 1799 and its quiet streets, time of leisure. In the depths of the Devonshire country and its quiet rills, a boy sits. Ostensibly, he is guarding kine. But, elbows on knees, he is deep in a book. Timis! Timis! But his mother, old Mrs. Cobbley, approaches furiously. Timis! Timis, where be thy wits, rattle brain? John Coo is almost into the bog. And half thy flock is turned he scattered. I know, Mother. What is it you know, pouring alone all day over the printed stuff? It's, 
It's not like other boys. I know, Mother, but old Mr. Dollington says that books open doors where begging fails. On now to 1810. It would surely take more than books to open the doors of Holland House, seat of London's wealth and fashion. Fame and fortune and beauty are present tonight. All that is richest and best in London, 1810. <laughs> Lord Davenport, the Duke of Argyle, Mr. Percy Fish Shelley. La, my dear, look. Shelley, the scribbler. What, that renegade? He. William Wordsworth, Lord Bath. Wordsworth. His poem, the excursion, is just out, they say. Look, my dear. Byron, how pale he looks. Byron. His Grace, the Archbishop of York, Mr. John Keats. Look, Keats. What? Keats, the scribbler? Keats is speaking now. Yes, and somebody's speaking to him. You are John Keats? You are Beau Brummel. Would I had thy power of versing, Keats? And I thy wit, Brummel. The Duke of Wellington... Mr. Thomas Cobley. And now we must leave the biography of Cobley, written and produced by Stephen Pinker, for Harry Hasmussen and his happy hobbledy hoist. You see what I mean. Of course, it's all absolutely splendid in a way, Embarrassing. But this is quite unfair. No relation to that. To be truly radiogenic, one more. Now, listen to me. It really isn't like that. Uh, Perhaps, perhaps all broadcasting is not really like that, nor is all listening quite as we've described it. Perhaps this is too serious a program for idle generalization. Yet, what is, in fact, the essence of how to listen? Is there a real how and a true method? What is the hearing of sound? This is how it is described in Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. To the sound, which is a collision of the air, three things are required. A body to strike, as the hand of a musician. The body struck, which must be solid and able to resist, as a bell or lute string. The medium, the air. The anatomy of sound. Does that really help us to listen? Perhaps the writers and the poets can tell us how to sharpen our ears. In the words of Robert Graves' poem... His eyes are quickened so with grief he can watch a grass or leaf every instant grow. Across two counties he can hear and catch your words before you speak. The wood louse or the maggot's weak clamor rings in his sad ear. And noise so slight it would surpass credence. Drinking sound of grass, worm talk. Clashing jaws of moth, chumbling holes in cloth. The groan of ants who undertake gigantic loads for honor's sake. The ability to be quick to sound the power of discrimination in sound, but perhaps more important than speaking for the ear is to speak for the mind's eye. Let the writer see and the listener imagine. So that you may think, when we speak of horses, that you see them printing their proud hoofs to the receiving earth. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think, when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs of the receiving earth. But it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass, for the which supply admit me chorus to this history, who, prologue-like, your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge, our play. Well, well, it sounds as if the programme was going to start at last. How to Listen... Here we go. ...by Stephen Potter and Joyce Grenfell was demonstrated... Good heavens, it's all over. Fine. Ah, oh, well, we're in plenty of time for the next programme.
How to Listen was demonstrated by Joyce Grenfell, Gladys Young, Betty Hardy, Louise Hutton, Carlton Hobbs, Geoffrey Wincott, Roy Plumley, Ivor Barnard, Derek Guider, and Ronald Simpson. The production was by Stephen Potter. <laughs>